I'm Meliha, and today uh, Anna and me will be hosting the Dice Lab webinar about computational design for a circular economy. Just quickly about uh, the Dice Lab. The Dice Lab uh, initiative was initiated by Sultan Chetin and Catherine De Wolf, and I'm part of the team together with Anna and Deepika. Uh, the Dice Lab is a knowledge sharing and networking platform uh, where the core idea is to bring academia, practice and policy together to discuss how digital technologies can accelerate the transition to a circular economy in the built environment. Uh, we are having these uh, webinars every two months and we focus on one digital technology as an enabler of a circular economy. Um, these are unique opportunities to discuss digital innovations in depth from different perspectives. And this time we are going to talk about computational design. So who are our speakers today? We have uh, Sasha Yuzan from uh, Bollinger and Koeman. He is a structural engineer. And we have uh, Mariana Popescu. She is an assistant professor at TU Delft. We'll start with Sasha. He will present about computational design for circularity. And we'll, I will just quickly introduce Sasha. If you have questions, um, please post them in the mirror board or in Zoom. We would prefer to put them in mirror board, but if you have any problems with the access to the mirror board, just put them here in Zoom and we will just place them there. Um, we will not have immediate questions after the presentation, but at the end, we will have a longer uh, panel discussion where we, can, we will go through each of the questions, hopefully. And you can also put either for each of the speaker a question or for a final discussion. We have one more slide at the very end in the mirror board where you can add questions for the panel discussion. So Sasha Uzan has been working as a structural engineer at Bollinger Grohmann uh, in Paris for more than three years. He started working after obtaining his double master's degree in civil and architecture engineering from KTH in Sweden and from Ecole Centrale Lyon in France. Over the years, he has gained experience in a large variety of projects from heavy refurbishment projects to massive timber construction. Sasha has pursued his master thesis work on sustainable design at Bollinger Grohmann by participating on the development of intern LCA tools for structural elements and promoting sustainable design in projects. Sasha, the stage is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. So today I would like to show you some projects where Bollinger and Grumman have used computational design algorithm to reuse existing structural elements. And But before that, I would like uh, to give you a quick introduction on the company and what we do. If you go on the next slide. So we are a, a global firm with a project all over the, the world. We have branches in uh, more than uh, 15 places, mostly in Europe, but some in Melbourne, Shanghai. Uh, we, do, we have an expertise in structural and facade uh, engineering, but we also do building physics and uh, fire uh, uh, calculation. We that and all this expertise uh, allowed us also to work on a quite um, uh, amazing project. Uh, if you go on the next slide, we have some uh, project that uh, to introduce uh, Bolling and Groman. We have uh, a complex structure and facade element like the Louvre Lens in France or the Deichmann Library in um, Oslo, Norway. Also um, in uh, the Taiwan Botanical Garden, which is a pretty complex timber structure that was done in uh, China and a heavy refurbishment project in Berlin up. Uh, and all in all, all this project and all this, uh, we have um, developed uh, the, the workflow that has been um, um, improved in the, the, in the 40 years of our existence. We, if you go on the next slide, we been from like a conventional workflows as a structural engineer when we have geometrical model that have been designed in uh, Reno, Grasshopper, and that has been uh, imported to the FEM uh, structural uh, um, uh, uh, software like uh, RFEM or Abacus. And then we have to uh, import it back to the geometrical uh, model. And that's uh, so. There's that's the interface is really uh, clear between the two. And we and to 
to reorganize this workflow, we have developed uh, in-house tools. If you go on the next slide, uh, like uh, Caramba 3D, which is a FVM software that is uh, embedded in the um, uh, Reno Grasshopper uh, environment that allows us to modify the geometry and directly get the structural result to get the displacement, the utilization force, and also some um, like Octopus, which is a multi-objective genetic uh, optimization uh, algorithm um, to allow us to have, a, if you go on the next slide, an, a more integrated workflow where we can work on the geometric model and also do the structural analysis at the same moment. So we have, uh, we used um, all the, the um, computational design element that we can put in the grasshopper element and to directly do the structural, structural calculation. This approach was, for example, really useful in the project like the roof of the France Mazarin Center. If you go on the next slide, the idea was to, to build the roof for this, uh, this center, which was based on the reciprocal um, uh, structures. And we wanted to change the geometry and to change the different parameters, the length of the element and the number of element to get the best design as possible and still getting the different um, uh, output, that were the, def the maximum deformation, the, the maximum quantity of element, the length of the uh, longest uh, beam element and with this multi-objective uh, that uh, um, um, output uh, we were uh, able to to design if you go on the next slide this uh, roof element that's a um, recyclable frame uh, that cover the front model center and this element was uh, made with the a workflow with, with the use of uh, Reno grasshopper caramba and octopus so this project is uh, um, an illustration of how we use the, uh, the all the computational design element to uh, to design uh, our our project and to go uh, a bit deeper in the the resolution of complex geometry while uh, uh, doing the structural calculation, and we also um, are were, um, interested in. Uh, working also uh, toward the uh, sustainability and uh, circularity. And we participate, uh, if you go on the next slide, to a workshop with uh, the Driven by Volume in 2021. Uh, this workshop, was, the idea was to uh, uh, to work on a pavilion and to, <clears throat> to see how we could uh, design a pavilion using uh, as the first input uh, 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 circularity and how to reduce the um, uh, environmental impact of the structures and what tools were uh, available and how to build a, a, a workflow that was uh, able to satisfy all these different uh, objectives. If you go on the next slide. So the approach was to incorporate the carbon footprint evaluation and circular economy into a structural design workflow with the different uh, tools like uh, Caramba, uh, we know all the different scripts that were uh, able to, that we could to, to work with. Uh, if you, yeah. And on it was a five day workshop where there was first the structural design then the life cycle analysis and the design, design with reuse, the optimization, the analyzation and how every step was also looking back at what was done before and how we could uh, find the right um, the right uh, solution. Um, this is some uh, um, um, uh, sorry. This is the um, the what was done by the student. The different projects that were done by the student. It was really interesting, and you could see that it was a lot of different. Uh, ideas and uh, solutions that were proposed by the student during this workshop. And so this workshop was uh, more like an academic well, an exercise to how we can build a structure with an existing uh, data set of element. And this idea was uh, reuse, redone uh, in the, the project I'm, that I'm going to tell you about that's called the uh, uh, Replace Pavilion. Um, 
Yeah, on the next slide. Um, so this replaced pavilion has been uh, collaboratively designed by the studio Chris Fox, Bollinger and Grumman, the University of Sydney, and the Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. And the idea was to have, um, so it's a combination of work of architect, artist, students, engineer, and design that wanted to explore circularity. And so we wanted to do like, it's a summer pavilion. So uh, in the courtyard of the um, uh, Sydney uh, University, I think. And um, the idea was we wanted to only use uh, existing uh, 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 timber element, if you go on the next slide. Uh, so the first idea was to design pavilion, uh, this pavilion using only repurposed uh, construction timber waste that was uh, uh, from a project that was in the region, also from uh, uh, the previous pavilion that was done the summer before uh, this one. So we had to uh, build a collection of data containing all the section, the length on the, of the, on the different elements that were available to build a new pavilion. And we also wanted to work with, um, uh, to, to develop this pavilion using a modular construction technique to make it, to, ma to make the pavilion the, uh, uh, in the simplest way of pos possible to limit the number of uh, connection detail and to the different element that was supposed to be assembled. If you go on the next slide. So we, only had uh, four different uh, modules that were uh, designed and they were uh, also um, recalibrated to have the minimum uh, wastage of the timber element that was collected before. So there was a real interaction between uh, the, the structure and the, the, the type of the module, the geometry of the module with the uh, existing timber element because we didn't want to, to bring any new element to the structures. Um, so in summary, this uh, pavilion is an example on how circularity can become an input for structural design for uh, also architectural design. And so this is a, a temporary element. It's, more, it's kind of an artistic project, but we also can, um, can see this uh, workflow and these uh, ideas in uh, different project over project. And the next one is the, so it's the rehabilitation of a sports center Tête Noire close to Lyon in France. You can see on this, uh, the pictures, we have some um, truss, uh, um, tr uh, column trusses that uh, are really, uh, that really make something about the facade of the, this uh, element. It was quite a, uh, it's, it's from the 60s, an old, uh, an old uh, building. And uh, if you go on the next slide, so the project was to, uh, in this uh, refurbishment rehabilitation of this idea, was to extend um, the size of the building. And so we have these four uh, main uh, uh, portal frame trusses uh, element made of steel, and we wanted to extend it. And we have to, we wanted to have the similar geometry for the. Uh, trusses that were carrying the roof. And we also wanted to have a, a to change the facade. So we wanted to dismantle the, <clears throat> the trusses that were composing the column. Uh, we had all this uh, bar element uh, uh, that we wanted that we had to demolish to cut and to 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 and the question was how can we reuse this element to build the, the new trusses that were going to to compose the extension of the of the sports center and in order to do that we if you go on the next slide we uh, we use the phoenix plugin that was that's uh, been developed by the epfl to try to find the right um uh the right uh uh, use of the element and what this uh, um, uh, um, algorithm do is you you give uh, the data set of existing element that you have the length the section the uh, the quantity and you also the output geometry that you want and it it gives you on depending on different um, um, criteria if you want to have the the less uh, new element that you have to bring in in the structure the less element that you have to cut the 
less uh, wastage of an existing element, different outcome. You see on the, it's a bit small, but then the black element are the existing element that have been used or the, the cut part. The gray one are the ones that are not been used and the blue one are the, the new element that, that have been brought to the structures. So this was the, the, the idea of the beginning of the, of the of this project. This project is still in the um, uh, conception phase. We're still working on it. And we, uh, by pushing this uh, project a bit forward, we, uh, we're facing some challenges. If you go on the next slide. Um, this is kind of the four main challenges of this uh, project is like, when you want to reuse existing steel element um, uh, of a structure that you want to dismantle and then you reuse it, we, you have to be like the company that does it has to be able to to give you a warranty of the that the steel are still uh, able to carry the load that have been designed to. So you have to uh, do the uh, characterization of the mechanical property of steel. Do you have to do it for all the elements, some element? Uh, you have to find the right methodology to do it. There's also a uh, question this uh, building from the 60s were covered in lead paint. So you have to take away this paint and you have to, to repaint it. It's also kind of uh, a heavy job to do it. It's And all this element can make the company to say that, okay, you, you can do it, but it's going to cost you way more than uh, if you just bring new element and you just dismantle an element that you can... Uh, uh, from uh, to the recycle uh, uh, element, and so in this project we face the so we have to um, to to push forward this solution. We have to discuss with the client, with the different uh, companies, to find the right solution and to see if it's still feasible to 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 reuse the structure and to 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 not just uh, bring new element. Um, and that's it for me. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Sasha, for this really uh, great presentation. Um, if everyone that has uh, questions, please don't forget to post them in the mirror board or here in Zoom, as I mentioned before. So our next speaker is Mariana Popescu, um, shortly to her um, background. Mariana is an architect and a structural designer with a strong interest in innovative ways of approaching the fabrication process and use of materials in construction. Her area of expertise is computational and parametric design with a focus on digital fabrication and sustainable design. Her extensive involvement in projects related to promoting sustainability has led to a multilateral uh, development of skills which combine the fields of architecture, engineering, computational design, and digital fabrication. Mariana, it's your turn. Thank you, Malika, and thank you, uh, Dicelab, for having me. It's really nice to uh, be here and have the opportunity to quickly present um, some of the work that I'm doing and together with, uh, with the team of people here as well. Um, so, I am going to be presenting kind of the work that I, I started in Delft about a year, a, a little bit, bit over a year ago. Uh, but of course, what I'm going to present spans a little bit more than that. Um, and then I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse of the future. So um, what I wanted to focus on in the presentation was a little bit on the material side of things, uh, because indeed, um, um, it, it's one of the things that is really enabled through computational design. Maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, so um, as a backdrop, um, it's something that uh, you all know, especially if you're here, but the construction industry is facing two main challenges. One is the environment and one is uh, digitization. Uh, the environment happens to also be a, a problem because of uh, our lack of productivity uh, due to a lack of digitalization. Um, so somehow there is a, a little bit of a, um, a a suspicion or a hope that by addressing one of them, we can also address parts of the other one. So by addressing some parts of digitalization, we can also address the challenge of the environment. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, this means that we usually um, can think of it of, as addressing it in terms of design. So how can we design better structures? 
Um, that also means that uh, we should not only be looking at design, but also at how um, these things are built. And somehow um, the thing that is maybe, I wouldn't say often overlooked, but not often very explicitly stated is that um, there is a fabrication uh, part in between. And if we bring the digitalization close to the fabrication side of things, we really enable that design and construction phase of things. Um, and the, the foundation for both of those are, of course, uh, computational design. So if we have, um, I would not like to see them separately, that design, um, so a, a, any number of combinations between design, fabrication, and construction, they're really inextricably linked. Um, can help us reduce material use in terms of raw material. It can also help us, once we have less material, tailor those material properties, specifically through, um, through computational design and fabrication uh, techniques. Um, it can also help us reduce uh, construction waste, so that's more in the construction phase. Um, and it can help us um, go beyond this and think of how we could have structural reuse. And of course, um, this means that actually the enabler, the, the, the cross-sectional uh, part that's really at the foundation of it all is, uh, of course, having the appropriate computational tools uh, to do this. Because as our designs or our approaches become more complex and as our materials become more complex, we really need those tools to be able to, um, to look into that. Um, specifically, what I um, look into most is um, the construction side of things. So really, uh, how can we reduce ma uh, material use, raw material use? Uh, but maybe it's more how we enable those designs that reduce raw material use. So if we go to the next slide, uh, it's really thinking of the construction phase of if we do know how to design uh, materially efficient structures, uh, with complex geometries, how do we um, actually manage to build them and not shift our waste from the, uh, from the, from the structure itself to how it's being constructed. Um, specifically, I wanted to give you examples of the, the type of work that I've done for the past years, which is really um, tackling this, uh, this question of construction waste in concrete construction um, and, um, and formwork. Um, of course, as I'm talking about molds, so how we, uh, how we fabricate something using molds, um, concrete can be put between brackets, um, and it could be any other material that requires a mold to be shaped in. Um, if we go to the next slide, specifically, um, I'm targeting to, pro to, to really develop a syst systems, or a system in this case, as an example, um, that is lightweight, and that lightweightness can be translated both in the lightweight of the structure itself, but also in how lightweight it has as a footprint in terms of the material that it uses during construction, that is fast to produce, um, that can enable us to um, reduce waste, uh, and hopefully uh, it can be used with minimal intrusion. So to be quite specific about that, I, um, I developed a flexible formwork system uh, what I mean with a flexible formwork system, it's one that's based on a membrane or a fabric that's tensioned into shape to give uh, the mold or the, the shape to, uh, to, a, to for concrete casting, as opposed to the traditional way of doing things where you would have uh, a timber or an EPS foam mold that is uh, milled and held up by scaffolding uh, in that case. The reason for this is because it's lighter. Again, it's fast. It's, uh, it produces a lot less waste than a rigid uh, mold, and it gives us the possibility to produce these kind of um, complex geometries um, without too much waste. So the way this would work in principle is that we start with a design, preferably a structurally informed design. So we already have a materially efficient structure. Uh, and for that, we produce a membrane or a textile. In my case, I work specifically with knitted textiles for this um, on existing industrial machines. Then that textile is um, tensioned into a rig, and that tensioning can happen in several ways. It could be done uh, by draping over uh, rigid elements. It could be done by inflating it. It could be done by um, having it be supported by splines or cables, um, or simply uh, in, a, in a rigid frame, as you see here. Um, and then it's coated um, to make the formwork. Uh, there are two challenges. It was just a, I, I just had a few more things to say on the previous slide, but it doesn't matter. Um, there are two there are two really major um, challenges to uh, to this, let's say, or we can uh, identify them as two uh, major challenges. One is the computational pipelines that you need to get 
from the design to the fabrication files. And I usually underline these a lot because it's what, enable, what enables us to actually be uh, more productive uh, about, our, uh, about our efficient designs. And the second challenge is how, how do we actually build? So once we do have these uh, fabricated um, uh, membranes, how do we build with them? So I'll show you an example of a project that deals with that second part, <laughs> indeed, if we go to the next slide um, of construction. Um, it's a fairly old project by now because it's a uh, it's from 2018 and at the uh, at the rate that we're going usually this uh, this uh, this is old but it did show um, it, it does mark a very special moment in the sense that it uh, showed how this this type of system could be used at scale. So the Nitcandela project was uh, built in 2018 in Mexico City in collaboration with Zahadid Architects uh, Code Group. Um, and um, it really showcases this uh, type of approach to having a flexible formwork uh, with a knitted textile. So if we go to the next um, slide, what you'll see is that um, there's, uh, what we start with is a, um, a textile that's being, that had been produced on an industrial knitting machine. And you'll see this huge long scarf on the, on the ground over there. Um, that is supported by a cable net. Uh, and tensioned into uh, into shape within a within a rig that wooden rig that is a little bit harder to see, but it's on the top le uh, left. You'll see it kind of being built outside in the courtyard, and on the top right, you'll see it um, being tensioned. And what I really like about this is that it shows you that lightness of having a a, a membrane, um, although you do still have some supports here and there. Um, then that membrane um, knitted textile is coated with a space with a thin layer uh, of cement-based coating that's um, developed also by a uh, specialist. So Lex, you can see there in the corner, um, was the, the concrete magician that came up with the, with the, right, uh, with the right formulation for this to work. Um, and then you're left with this nice um, thin rigid formwork. The reason for this is to build up that strength in layers because a knitted textile is very deformable. So as you might understand from the idea that we have a flexible formwork system, um, you'll, um, it, it means that it can move. So if you cast directly, it will deform quite a lot. This kind of building up of strength in layers is what also makes it possible. Um, what's specifically interesting to note here is that those kind of, um, of course, this type of um, textile then um, uh, carried the, the five tons of concrete. You can go to the next one. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go as, uh, uh, along with it. Um, so uh, once the concrete is cast onto it, it looks a little bit like this. Um, well, not a little bit, a lot like this. This is exactly what it looks like. Um, but um, the idea here is that um, we have some, um, not only a lightweight system, but we have a few other improvements in terms of, uh, of what it does for construction. So if we go to the next slide, I think, yes. Um, it has um, some specifics in terms of how much it costs. So the uh, the textile um, and the cable net and so on, but excluding the frame for about 50 square meters of, um, of uh, surface area cost around 2,250 euros. So that's something that's um, that's quite, uh, quite affordable. Um, it weighed, the textile itself weighed 25 kilos, the cable net and everything, another 30. So 55 kilos carried five tons of concrete. We have a, a point of productivity in the sense that uh, you can uh, produce the 50 square meters were produced in about 36 hours on industrial knitting machine, um, which is um, and normally um, 50 square meters of EPS foam molds would be about 720 hours. So there's really an or a, quite a high order of magnitude there. And it took us 14 weeks to get from the design to the uh, to the structure standing there. So that's really um, a very fast uh, production pace. So none of these things, um, if we go to the next one, are really um, possible, of course, without um, having computational pipelines. Having computational pipelines, of course, for design and analysis, but also those computational pipelines for fabrication. So being able to talk to the machine, being able to get those, um, those instructions to it so that we can actually produce it. While the machine produces fast, we also need to get the instructions fast enough, right? Um, so one of the challenges there, um, if we go to the next slide, indeed, uh, one of the challenges there is that we are not working in the uh, fashion or object industry, which is what uh, what um, 
uh, normally these machines are used for, but really at a larger scale. So we want to get in an automated way from design to a knitting pattern, which is the instructions for the machine, um, so that we make sure that we can also produce this. So this is where um, I developed the computational pipeline in Python to, to really do this. And that's what enabled this um, such a fast um, production of it. If we go to the next slide. Um, the next project I wanted to show you is um, something that we finished this year. Um, well, no, actually last year, but a couple of months ago. Um, and it's uh, built at the Maxi Museum in, um, in uh, Rome. Um, and this one is um, showing the same type of system, but taking it a little bit to the next level. So it's showing, uh, it's showing if we go to the next slide, it's again a reinterpretation of a, uh, an existing structure, an homage to, uh, to Nervi, so to the, um, to the Italian engineer, and to really look at how we can uh, produce these kind of ribbed, uh, ribbed structures in, a, in an efficient way. Now, uh, in this case, we're going closer to, um, to what industry can, um, can identify as something useful in the sense of that geometry that even might be globally a little bit doubly curved, but um, the rest of it is quite, um, is, is quite recognizable to industry in terms of ribs. Uh, it includes reinforcement, and that reinforcement is also um, happens to be the scaffolding or the carrier uh, for the knitted um, textile that's supposed to make the mold. So in this case, we reduce that uh, that need for external um, special external scaffolding, uh, except for the props that can be removed and also reused um, uh, immediately elsewhere. If we go to the next slide. Um, in this case, um, what is also very uh, interesting to point out is that uh, we again come to a complexity of the um, of the material. But what I wanted to focus on is also something that you see a little bit in the uh, spaces in between, so in the diamonds in between the uh, in the ribs, and you'll see that the material is very specifically um, very specifically has different densities. Um, and that's uh, part of being able with this type of process to steer the, um, the, the layout of the material or the material properties that you have. Um, again, uh, computational tools are really important for this in, in a few ways that the fact that we can specify those material properties very specifically because of a particular uh, fabrication process, but that we also are able to actually generate those types of uh, properties. And for that, in this project, of course, those computational pipelines uh, for production and for generation of those patterns needed to be further developed so that we can do it at a completely different scale, actually three times as big as the previous one, uh, which is why this is also quite, uh, quite important in terms of scalability. So if we go to the next slide, I think, um, Besides being able to really make those uh, those tools, what is also important is to have that uh, that kind of uh, knowledge dissemination or transfer. Um, so we work closely uh, also with the uh, knitting machine manufacturers that are also actually quite uh, interested in these types of developments because it opens up their fields to a totally new uh, to a totally new uh, sector. And it's also what makes it possible for our sector, the construction sector, to actually adopt these things without needing to build up an, a whole new set of extensive knowledge. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, finally, what I um, really, because these are the last couple of slides, what I really wanted to highlight here is that having these kind of uh, informed uh, computational pipelines for production means that we have control over our material and our uh, way of producing that material. So we can have these types of tailored properties, but we can also have different materials in terms of having phase change materials or adaptive materials, um, biodegradable materials and reuse. These are just a few keywords that I'm putting there because we're working currently with, the, uh, with these. I might not be able to show you everything about it yet, um, but these are the kind of directions that really uh, look into how, um, how we can work with these types of materials. So if we talk about reuse of reusable material, it means that we also try to keep that embodied energy that we've uh, pumped into certain materials in, in the first cycle of production uh, and try to reuse them. So I wanted to show you one example from my, uh, from, uh, from my group now. Uh, if you go to the next slide with, that we're working on, uh, just one uh, in that sense, with a little bit of a nod to, um, to the Structural Exploration Lab at, uh, at EPFL, of course. Um, what we're trying to do here is have structural reuse where uh, we use uh, reclaimed planar concrete elements and look at how that uh, construction waste can be reassembled into, um, into dome stru shell structures. 
Um, this is really um, in, in a way that minimizes offcuts and that has a proper interlocking geometry that follows force flows and is, and is, uh, uh, and is um, working uh, proper structurally uh, in, a, in a proper way. Um, and this is, uh, this is something that um, Raitis, who's working on this, might is a very happily uh, is hap very happily exploring without probably knowing what a challenging problem he's actually um, he's actually having to tackle. Um, in the sense that you need computational tools here that are actually quite difficult in, ta in taking uh, an existing stock of, uh, of material in trying to minimize those offcuts in knowing how to, um, how to really combine these things so it really becomes efficient. So those questions of how we work with reclaimed materials um, are really, uh, really important in terms of, um, of cir circular economy and computational tools are the only way that we're going to, um, to get there. So, for the final slide, what I wanted to uh, do is give a nod to uh, to the group of uh, to the group that I work with here. Um, I've only highlighted the work of Raitis, but basically what we're doing is working on these types of material properties at different scales, uh, both on the um, simulation, prediction, and design side of things, on how they can be reused uh, on adaptive systems, uh, hybrid textiles. Uh, that are made of different materials and deployable systems that we look into how you could temporarily have them um, rigid or not and also um, disassemblable and reassemblable elsewhere and i'm really grateful to have this uh, bunch of people here and that's it thank you very much mariana also for you a uh, really nice presentation very exciting content uh, we will now proceed with the panel discussion. So I'm handing over to Anna. We have some questions um, in the mirror board. So all the others, you take your time to place some questions uh, in the discussion or in any of the presenters. Yeah. So Mariana or Sasha. Yeah. So we have some time maybe for people um, to write down the questions. Um, Maybe I, I, I wanted to, to ask you something that you brought up at the end, Mariana, that I think you both show up, you know, like these amazing pipelines from how we can use computational design to support us during the design phase, like to optimize structure, to reduce material too much. Um, and I think, you know, like we've experienced, um, um, how you say it, a lot of de development, you know, like in terms of tools to support uh, these workflows. Um, and you both have, have been part of you know, the, the development of these tools. Maybe you can say a few words about like how you approach it. Like, you know, like you have an objective, you want to achieve something, which is your process to, to develop these tools. I don't know um, if you can share some, some, some thoughts on that um, with the audience. And also, I'm interested to see, you know, like from academia and 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 practice, you know, like to see if you face different challenges or, you know, like there's some similarities in on how to to approach these these challenges. You you can go, Maria. <laughs> I think it's a very, thank you for the question. It's a very tough question because it almost looks for the recipe of how to do it. Um, and if I'm being completely honest, um, I don't think there is one way of doing it. And every every single time, it's a little bit different. Um, what I can um, say is that it it does um, it does have to be a little bit different for every for every kind of setup. So even though we all try to kind of um, find the 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 um the solution that works for every case <laughs> you will always have exceptions um so one of the uh, one of the very important parts is to know your problem very well and set it up um in those in those terms because you won't be able to necessarily solve a very general problem um without uh, without adaptation of your algorithms so um the way for me, at least, it's usually to try to dive in and, and solve a specific problem and then zoom back out <laughs> and try to see which of those elements from that problem can actually be abstracted and um, 
rewritten probably because we usually uh, maybe use uh, Python code rewritten in a different way so that it becomes more general and could be applied in different uh, in different circumstances. Um, I can give a very specific example maybe, but um, some of the if the principles behind it uh, work the same way, they can be repurposed. Um, but I usually dive with solving the problem and then zooming out, but knowing what problem you want to solve. So it's kind of a learning um, by doing experience where you have a general problem, you try to reduce that problem by targeting or trying to solve a small part and then like looking again back from like a broader perspective and see how then it can be adapted. Interesting. Correct. Sasha? <laughs> <laughs> what else? Uh, for me, I think when we do like uh, for a specific project, we have we kind of know where we want to go. We have all the design that is a bit uh, already be drawn in a way that's like architectural architectural input. So we have also I think, and we don't want to spend too many hours to work on a script on a, something that can solve every situation. So we have to. Uh, we really understand what's the problem, what are the objectives that we want to to re, to resolve. What the and also it's important to keep a track on what has been done for different projects. If we can uh, readapt some uh, uh, work that has been done to not redo something that has already been done, and so for example the 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 replace pavilion, the, the script that was developed for this project, was. Um, an improvement of the kind of the script that was also developed for the workshop uh, with uh, driving with uh, on circularity because it's a work that has already been done but the geometry was a bit different so we had to adapt it and to different inputs but i think we want to try to find the uh, if you really uh, you have to specify well the problem and what you want so you don't to something that is too complex to how to code and to how to to solve and and to be efficient no and in that sense for example in the last project you were saying that you reuse uh not the well reuse that you took advantage of the work developed uh, at epfl um are you just reusing it directly are you applying some modifications are you aware because i don't know how much involved you are in the project and if you can give more details and yeah yeah, yeah i think the, uh, the, the idea was first to like to we we saw that uh, script that was developed and we wanted to try to see what was what it was doing and we we used this element and i i wasn't working on the project but i think some of uh, my colleagues tried to also use the caramba 3d uh, uh, to com to combine to go a bit deeper on the structural analysis of the element. So we, we use existing script that you can we can find and we try to understand them and to see how we can improve for what we are doing and because we're a structural engineer and we want to, it's also, the, uh, we have to, to. So maybe your approach is more kind of doing a puzzle of different things that have already developed and see if they can support in, in targeting the problem. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm gonna go for the questions that uh, the audience has written, and the first one um, it's asking like, what do you think the industry needs, and how researchers can support industry in 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 adopting these digital tools? It's also funny, you know, because maybe Mariana from the researcher side, like what do we think as researchers the industry needs? And then maybe having, you know, like a, the practice approach, like um I, I would say that it, it what we need is to work together with industry, right? So it, you you'd see that okay, if you do develop tools within academia to do certain mm -hmm. to solve certain problems make sure that they are usable in an industry setting, right? So you, you try to, uh, to on the one hand, to get that adoption, and that works a little bit well by making them open source or by making them freely accessible and well-documented. You see that with, with yes, uh, most things that are being adopted. Um, 
or or also with uh, Sasha's examples where you do use tools that are, have been maybe originally also developed in academia. I also think it's good to work together, right? To really understand where where do we uh, where are the points where we lack things, or where that kind of knowledge or those algorithms are needed. Because at the same time, the same way you say, look, we can't spend all the time developing those algorithms, um, but they might be very useful. Um, it's good to know that, right? It's good to know that because they can be uh, developed in an academic environment, I guess. Okay. So try to bring closer um, when developing projects in research the industry to actually be targeting non needs that um, or 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 tools that are interesting for them. Do you often collaborate with researchers um, in your projects at Bollinger Grumman, Sasha? Like, is this something that you approach, or normally you do something like as you mentioned before to to collect things that have been developed and and kind of like rearrange them in-house to, to make them work? No, uh, we, we are in close uh, connection with uh, researchers. Many of the people that work here also have uh, teaching, uh, do teaching in university, uh, architecture university. Or, so we're quite close with the academy and the research. And uh, for, we have also uh, a PhD candidate uh, working at, uh, in Paris at Boeing and Roman that is doing a thesis while also working for Bollinger and Grumman. Uh, she's working on uh, um, uh, uh, sustainable, sustainable sustainability with uh, uh, intelligence, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So we also we we are close to to research, and we we also want to develop things that are maybe not in in if we can find things in our project that we can develop a bit further to. To go close to research more than just project, it's also something that we are willing to do and we want to do. And then maybe going back again to circularity, because I think uh, this is one of the challenges that uh, no circularity is kind of a new topic, and we're trying to use computational tools that it's also new <laughs> to support, you know, like new um, workflows towards circularity. So. Um, some of your work, not the beginning that you've presented, it's more from the previous work on computational tools to kind of com conceptualize how this can support not next um, projects that you're doing. So there's a question asking, like, how do you specifically like um, define yourself within circularity? And I think it's something, you know, that Mariana was saying, like, before we started this meeting, that it's something that you are working for or that you are planning not to. Uh, um, to start working in the next year. So if you kind of um, can simplify no, in, in a couple of sentences, uh, like how do you think your work or your learnings in computational design are going to support your, your work in circularity? How would you do it? Or how would you define it? Uh, it's, it's something that we actually uh, implemented in our work to uh... Every time we 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 do a design, we're doing the LCA calculation of the structure to get the to get the output of the uh, embodied carbon of what we design to also what when we do a different uh, solution to have the comparison with the embodied carbon and to to really think about the sustainability of our design and to know what we are doing and why we are doing this thing and to understand the consequences of our, our work. Yeah. So it's going more towards like taking informed decisions in terms of um, environmental impact. Um, but also you show some works, no, like on the reuse part. So it's kind of like it's helping you have no like a more uh, informed assessment of 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 these decisions of reusing material. Um, um, no, in the new designs. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, okay. we we. I think it's it's give give us new like new inputs new things that we before we were focusing on the structural uh, element the displacement the stresses the utilization and now we have to take into account and we want to take into account the uh, the embodied carbon the the um, all the different environmental impact and if we can uh, limit the quantity of new element that we're going to bring in the design that's something that we are working on. I can add something from from this side. So um, 
of course, uh, that way, right? So to really look at the embodied carbon and things and and uh, how we can minimize the amount of new materials that uh, that we bring in. Um, but actually, the the question of reusing certain materials in a way that they are not actually downcycled, <laughs> but uh, but brought back in a in a high grade uh, in a high grade sense, so that they um, so that they can be used in construction anew. Let's say. Um, is one of the is one of the challenges there, and for this, um, computational tools are just. I mean, we can use the same computational tools for design, or develop the same type of computational tools for the, for design as before, except for there are more constrained problems that we need to to solve. So it brings in more constraints for those uh, for those tools, and it makes them very challenging. So there's plenty of research to be done on this in the in the computation in computational sense. That's one, and then the other one is that we for for me at least is that you can. Um, embed intelligence in your material so that if we start looking at how we embed intelligence in our material then we can start right now we're in the place where we're saying okay all of this old material that's been there but has not been designed to be reused we're going to figure out a way to reuse it but from everything that we do from now on we probably should design it um, so, such that it can become reusable at some point uh, in a in a structured uh, in a structural way so for that uh, computation really comes comes back in and that's one of the uh, that that designing of materials that will be reused in the future and thank you for this contribution because you are also um there was a person asking no, how did you in, i do you envision no um you, the the use of computational computational tools for design for this assembly um and also about the limitations you kind of um um mentioned them a little bit um could you maybe like both of you like before we finish because we have two 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 minutes to wrap up like um what do you think is your biggest challenge to 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 solve you know like in in the next steps that um I know it's complicated but like if just to kind of wrap up and and um so what are you gonna try to to solve uh, with computational design next. <laughs> I think uh, I can maybe start. I think it's it's going to be a tool that we're going to use to convince all the different uh, uh, actors of the construction, the client, the constructors, all the different uh, the architect that it's feasible. It's we we have the element. We can arrange things that mm -hmm. it's it's a tool that help us prove prove that it's uh, feasible and that's uh, that there's a real gain for environmental circularity and. Yeah. Okay, Mariana, we can leave it here. Like we had one meeting, and I think this is a great way to to finish to kind of use the these computational tools to actually like bring awareness and convince people to um to get involved I, or to support no circular strategies. Um, there are a couple of more questions that maybe you can just um yeah write down your answer so 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 people can come back to the mirror board um but yes like i would like to conclude and thank you uh for coming today uh to all the attendees and and also well in particular to the to the speakers for for being here with us um we are starting to prepare uh the next couple uh the next couple of events um the next webinar webinar is going to be about gis for circularity and we are also gonna help another like researchers meetup where we like discuss maybe ideas uh, in a more informal setup. So also like feel free to join. We are going to um, announce them through our LinkedIn channels. Um, and yes, thank you, thank you very much um, for coming and connecting um, today to this presentation.